I was mourning for a child that I'd lost. I loved her so much, I still love her. I'm her mum. <laughs> I can just remember lying there thinking it would be better to die. A historical injustice is what happened to us. Other countries have recognised it, and it's high time ours did. Everyone was saying, if you love your baby, you will give him up. Sixty years ago, British society was very different. The bride's name is Stella. She's 19, lives in Barnet, and is getting... Marriage was the cornerstone of family life. Till death us do part. Till death us do part. According to God... Pregnancy out of wedlock was one of the most potent taboos. <laughs> Yet that's what happened to hundreds of thousands of women. And the consequences were devastating. I was really, really scared and I just blotted the whole thing out because apparently that's what teenagers do. Diana de Vries was 16 when she became pregnant. Soon after, she met a social worker who made it clear what was to come. You'll do the best thing. This is, this is your only option. You'll give your child to your proper mummy and daddy because you can't possibly be a parent to your child. You can't, you're not, you're not fit to be a mother. Veronica Smith was also unmarried. My mother didn't tell my father because she said it would kill him. So he never knew? No. Ever? Never. The pressure on unmarried women to give up their babies for adoption took hold in the 1950s and coincided with the growing demand for babies from childless couples in post-war Britain. We were asked to prepare a layette for the baby. But thousands of those women, including Anne, wanted to keep their babies. Told me. And Yet everyone from baby homes to social workers to doctors, midwives and nurses made them feel like they had no choice but to give them up. It was coercion. The phrase was, this will be for the best. This will be for the best for the baby. This will be the best for you. Because if you really love this baby, um, you will make sure that he has a different life and not with you, and that the best thing to do is to give him up. Tonight's debate is about the abolition of discrimination. In later life, Anne would become an MP and junior health minister. But as a teenager in a maternity hospital, even at the moment of delivery, the treatment of her as an unmarried woman from the midwife was callous. When I asked for help, I wasn't given any help for pain. In fact, I was told, I remember, you will remember this, so you won't be wicked again. 16-year-old Diana de Vries faced an equally cruel experience in the delivery room. And somebody said, it's a girl. She said, this baby's flagged for adoption. I'm, I'll take her away. And I can remember yelling and saying, please bring her back, bring her back. I can just remember lying there thinking it would be better to die. I didn't die.
but the trauma that thousands of unmarried women faced during the birth of their children was not the end of their experience. For new mothers like Judy Baker, there came the summons to the adoption centre. Take us to the day of the handover, when you pass your baby on, your baby daughter on to the authorities. How difficult a day was that? She was asleep. She never woke up. And they took her from me and gave her to the people who were waiting in the next room to adopt her. And that was it. How could that have happened to me? But my mum was waiting for me downstairs and we went shopping. We went shopping. <laughs> I loved her so much. I still love her. I'm her mum. <laughs> Academic studies point to hundreds of thousands of unmarried mothers in Britain being pressured into handing over their babies in the three decades after the Second World War. But it wasn't just the birth mothers left with an agonising sense of loss. So too were many of their children. I had an identity forced upon me. It left me with a sense of not belonging. I was somebody else. Jan was born in 1960 to an 18-year-old unmarried mother and the adoption didn't go well. I had no love whatsoever. I'm angry, I'm angry for um, the system allowing me to be given to those people. I'm angry for, for the trauma and pain caused to my, my birth mother. But some adoptions did work. I was lucky. I had really good parents. I was lucky. But what about everyone else? Rachel Langham moved to Canada and into a loving home, but still feels her birth mother suffered an appalling injustice, having been forced to give her up. It's terrible. It's almost inhumane what happened to her. I feel terrible uh, empathy, you know, um, and sorrow for her, and it's terrible. But you certainly should apologise for any heinous things that you've done. An apology is at the heart of this story. Because you know the sorrow and suffering of forced adoption. Eight years ago, that's exactly what 250,000 Australian women received when their horrific stories of forced adoption came to light. Today, this parliament, on behalf of the Australian people, takes responsibility and apologises for the policies and practices that force the separation of mothers from their babies. Now, the birth mothers in Britain have sent this letter to Boris Johnson asking the government here to say sorry. A historical injustice is what happened to us. Other countries have recognised it, and it's high time ours did. Well, it would be very good if somebody said, I'm sorry. They told me I would forget, and I would go on, and I could have other children. But I never did. Why would you, when you think that you've given, you've given your child away? Why, why would you think that you deserve to have other children? What have you missed out on? Well, 
being a mum. And it's difficult. I've got stepchildren now, but I don't know, don't know how to mother. I don't know how to, because I haven't done it. It's not just me, it's thousands, thousands of women. <clears throat> and it was so wrong.